Good evening, everyone, and welcome. We are all so excited to have you join us here tonight for our special 305 Day, celebrating the vibrant cultural impact of our trend-setting, world-renowned hometown, Miami. Whether you're from the 305 or just really love Miami, being here tonight, you are officially part of our 305 Miami family. My name is Katherine Mesa, and I'm a senior FIU Honors College student, Hamilton Scholar, and the Governmental Relations Intern here at the Washington and DC office. Today is a very special day as we're keeping the magic of Miami alive right here in the nation's capital. At FIU, we are proud to wave the 305 banner and propel the careers of our city's future leaders as we advocate for solutions to meet the needs of our community. Whether it is environmental resilience like the event here tonight, FIU continues to take the lead on revolutionizing a positive future for everyone. As you all know, Miami is a diverse city that encompasses a wide range of cultures and backgrounds. So naturally, we have to bring the sounds and flavors of our dynamic city here to the 202. Whether it be our savory Jamaican patties, fresh conch fritters, and of course, let's not forget our beloved shots of cafecito, we want you to feel as if you're right back in sunny Miami. Tonight's event is focused on the innovations of climate technologies and its ties with the 305. We are excited to partner with the Aspen Institute and look forward to their Aspen Ideas Climate next week in Miami, in addition to the Emerge Americas Conference later this spring. We also want to recognize an exciting development with the recently launched Climate Ready Tech Hub designated by the EDA, which aims to scale up environmental resilience technologies in South Florida. To get us started on all things environment, climate tech, and Miami, please enjoy the following video highlighting the initiatives of this new development. We are here in DC today and tomorrow to talk about South Florida's Regional Tech Hub. We were designated by the EDA as the only climate resilient tech hub in the United States and the only tech hub in the state of Florida. So we want to make sure that different agencies and members of Congress learn more about our work to commercialize climate technology from South Florida to the world. From the FIU perspective, I know the wall of wind is one of the assets that's going to be used for Jolson's group, and so that, that will be a test bed for some of the manufactured goods and stuff that, that we work with the startup companies for. From the Institute of Environment's perspective, we are involved in the reef seawall project, working with UM, OnePrint, and a couple other smaller Eco Creek companies. What the Institute brings to this is, of course, our robotics, our autonomous vehicles, our uh, environmental sensing capabilities. And so as we place these reefs and these new seawalls in place, what my guys will do is use our autonomous vehicle capabilities to go along and basically measure their effectiveness. We've been having weekly meetings for months now, but it's always good to sit down and, and talk face to face. Our biggest differentiator is sustainable, resilient, and climate infrastructure. So I'm here to learn, share, and connect with different federal agencies and advocates of all tech hub. The idea is that we have a variety of different companies, public and private institutions that already work on some of these topics to help our buildings be more efficient, to bring renewable energies to the world, but it needs some coordination, it needs the ability to kind of group all of these efforts together in order for them all to be able to succeed and grow together in one place. And we think the South Florida is a perfect place to do that. If the South Florida Climate Tech Hub is successful in phase two funding, this will allow us to be the world leader in climate resilience and clean energy. This will allow us to go to other cities and other countries to say, we have something that works, we're resilient, and we're ready to scale. All right, thank you, Catherine. Good evening, everyone. Carlos Becerra with FIU. So glad to have you here. Of course, it's a super Tuesday because the date is 305, right? Um, let's give a round of applause to Catherine Mesa. It's been, uh, and you'll have many of our students uh, uh, littered throughout this amazing, beautiful uh, embassy in, in Washington, DC. But today uh, at FIU, we're also celebrating uh, Give FIU 305 Day. There's a lovely QR code on the outside. 
Uh, we're pleased to be hosting about 28 students here this semester. Uh, that is made uh, possible by the strong support of our colleges and schools and many uh, uh, individual donors. So if you're uh, able and willing, uh, please consider that. Uh, on the heels of this amazing video, uh, I want to give a shout out to some individuals, uh, namely uh, Philip Druzak, Miami-Dade County. This climate tech hub is, uh, is very much, uh, we can say, collaboration. We all know it in abstract, but when you're talking about four counties, uh, about five or six key uh, core universities, over 40 partners, uh, Monday afternoon calls for the last eight months, just about, uh, finally to get our application uh, in uh, last Thursday. Uh, it, let's just be honest, it's been very sticky, very fun, uh, and, but uh, if we're looking at regional collaboration, and all led by Miami-Dade County, so we're excited uh, to have uh, Philip here, and I know many of our members of Congress and uh, full delegation are in uh, support of that. I do want to thank uh, folks that you'll be hearing from soon, Emerge Americas, Aspen Ideas Climate. Um, you'll, have, uh, you'll see the, uh, the benefits of uh, lovely giveaways from our sponsors like Bustello, uh, the Greater Miami Convention and Visitors Bureau. Uh, we're excited to, uh, to collectively uh, uh, celebrate Miami, and I know many of our individual staff members have even bigger visions for what this day will be in the future. Um, and uh, here this evening, uh, as it turns out, because on any given day and week, and uh, our members of Congress will attest, uh, we have amazing individuals from Miami, from the 305, traveling to D.C. Uh, this evening, we happen to have our uh, leadership from our Center for International Business Ed Education uh, Research. If you can raise your hands, Sumit Kundu, Jillian, um, and Luciana uh, from our College of Business here. Tomorrow, they'll spend the day advocating. So. Um, Another very special person I would like to introduce, very important to the Miami story uh, and to FIU because uh, of a very rich friendship and partnership. Where is she? B. Brickle. You heard that right. B. Brickle, as in that Brickle. B. is the great uh, uh, granddaughter of uh, Mary Brickle and the Brickle family and excited to have a part-time uh, Washington, D.C. resident. Uh, and you'll hear from her in a little bit. Um, but without further ado, uh, another special honor we have today is to recognize uh, the st strong leadership and support and collaboration with our members of Congress. We're here to talk about climate technologies and environment and resilience. Um, and I know I can speak on behalf of FIU when it comes to investing in Miami and our research partners. Uh, this South Florida delegation has delivered uh, and our Florida delegation has delivered. Uh, last year, uh, I have to do my job. This delegation was able to help secure for FIU about $26 million to support water quality testing uh, in Biscayne Bay, to support uh, uh, saltwater intrusion studies, to support environmental robotics. And one member in particular is here with us today, um, uh, Congresswoman Frederica Wilson, who yes, represents uh, our Biscayne Bay campus, but more than that, represents the full swath of Miami and our potential. Uh, in particular, uh, we have not yet done the formal uh, check presentation, but I know your team is on it and we're on it. Uh, was able to secure for FIU a $9 million uh, earmark for an environmental robotics facility. <laughs> and light your candles, cross your fingers. If all things go as planned with uh, this week's minibus, another million dollars for uh, uh, the coastal uh, Everglades, and uh, coastal Biscayne Bay restoration. And that is Frederica Wilson, and we're here to give her thanks. And Congresswoman Wilson, we'd love to have you say a few words. Hello, everybody. So we're here celebrating uh, 305, area code 305. And I don't think anyone is more Miami than me in this whole uh, delegation that we have coming here. I was born in Miami, raised in Miami, educated in the Miami-Dade County Public Schools, and graduated from the University of Miami. So how much more Miami can you be? And um, even before there was a Miami, my grandparents immigrated from the Bahamas and my great grand uncle was one of the signatories on the um, 
the uh, resolution for the city of Miami. When Miami, even before there was a Miami. So when I became a principal, I was placed in a school called Skyway Elementary, which is now called Dr. Frederica S. Wilson Elementary. And the school was comprised of little children who were Cuban immigrants. So everything I learned about Cuba and all of the social mores and the cafecito and all of the wonderful things, I learned it from my little children in school. So every morning, because the little African-American children were bused into the school for integration purposes, and I was trying to make sure that everyone was bilingual. So my little Cuban-American children who came from Cuba, we were trying to teach them English, and my little African-American children, we were trying to teach them Spanish. So every morning, everyone would say, Uro Fidelidad, Abadandavo, de los Estados Unidos de América, y a la República que simboliza una nación, Dios mediante, invisible con libertad y justicia para todos. And that's the Pledge of Allegiance in Spanish. And some of you in here who speak Spanish can't even say that. <laughs> so, I just love Miami. I love the 305. I love all of the children, especially the way that they share each other's culture, each other's history, and I'm so proud to be a part of Florida International University. The partnership I have with Florida International University is just absolutely fabulous. My little boys and the 5,000 role models of excellence for years have graduated from the third grade all the way through middle school, through high school, and they've gone to Florida International University. They are engineers, lawyers, doctors. They run Miami-Dade County Public Schools. Some of you know them. I was just asked the other day when they came around with the judges to uh, see who made the best Cuban coffee, I call it. And they asked me, how many boys do you think the 5,000 role models of excellence has touched? And I said, not only the boys, but their families, their uncles, their daddies, their mothers, their brothers, their cousins, their neighbors, their church members, their friends, over one million. So thank you for having this today, and there's nothing like the 305. Yeah. <laughs> and better always when we say it in full pink. Look at that. I love it. Uh, I see we've been joined by one of our uh, alum, uh, an alumnus of ours that's an elected official, Mayor Joe Rasco, the village of Key Biscayne. Thank you for joining us. So to get us started and to celebrate what are uh, some amazing global uh, conferences and festivals, it's my honor to introduce uh, a great partner of FIU, and uh, we're now at the 10-year mark of an amazing uh, conference, Emerge Americas. And it's my honor to introduce Diane Vidoni, the Chief Operating Officer, uh, who has 25 years of experience in convention, exhibit planning, and hospitality industry. And we'll learn from her, as well as our panelists, some exciting things that are underway in Miami in the 305. Diane. Is that better? Ah, there he is. I'm actually going to invite uh, my panelists, Maria and Frederick, to join me because we're going to kick off uh, learning a little bit more about one of Frederick's projects um, before I do a little intro and have uh, a little chat about what's happening in climate in Miami. <laughs>
Wow, that just gives an, us an idea of all that's happening in and around climate, and especially in Miami. So I'm, I'm excited to have joined me today Maria Ortiz Perez. Maria is the Managing Director of the Energy and, and Environment Program at the Aspen Institute. The program addresses critical energy, environmental, and climate change issues through nonpartisan, non-ideological convening with the specific intent of bringing together diverse stakeholders to improve the process and progress of policy level dialogue. And Frederick Wanyus is the co-founder of OnePrint. As we saw, OnePrint's vision is to revolutionize infrastructure manufacturing and construction by designing and producing at scale 3D concrete products on site in never before possible shapes and sizes that will meet the imp important needs of today's climate challenges. So thank you, Maria and Frederick, for being here this evening. Um, as we kick off, Maria, uh, what are you looking forward to most about Ide Aspen Ideas Climate, which is less than a week away in Miami? It is. Um, and um, thank you so much for that to FIU, our friends at FIU, for having me here and giving me the opportunity to share with you my excitement about Aspen Ideas Climate. Indeed, it's taking place uh, starting March 11th, so on Monday, Monday to Wednesday. We're going to have, it's our third annual convening. We're very proud to partner with the city of Miami Beach. We've done the convening for three years now. And um, it's not only uh, the city of Miami Beach that partners with us, but we have incredible partners in the South Florida community, including FIU for sure. And the essence of the Aspen Institute, what we do really is we bring thinkers, doers, people, and stakeholders who are interested about solving the great challenges of our time. And I'm very fortunate to be part of the team that is working on climate change. Uh, our premise is that climate change is an urgent, uh, very urgent um, issue, but it is solvable. If, if the community, governments, uh, companies, and the public come together and think about solutions. And Aspen Ideas Climate is really about that. It's a conference about solutions. It's a convening in which we bring together members of the public, investors, uh, scientists, innovators, business leaders, academics, like really a very wide range of folks to think together and to collaborate about um, to think about what solutions we can come up with to face this great challenge, this great challenge of our time. So this year, uh, there's certainly a focus on green tech. Green te we couldn't uh, talk about climate solutions without thinking about green tech. And we're going to have a re very wide range of sessions, anything from very interactive workshops to main stage speakers with big headliners to, uh, I would say, more of a, a specialized uh, spark talks, some round tables, a very wide variety of formats as well, so people can find uh, different sessions to inspire them. We want very, uh, like our ultimate goal is to have folks who come to the conference feel inspired and empowered to take action because that's really what we want. We want folks to take action to solve the climate crisis. So that's Aspen Ideas Climate. So as I said, March 11 to 13. And on Green Tech, I think I'm very excited about those sessions. I mean, I'm very excited about all the sessions, but we are going to, of course, cover uh, um, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is ubiquitous at this point. So really thinking about uh, what is science fiction and what are actually solutions that are scalable and that can be uh, made commercial. And Frederick, you're gonna talk about uh, some of the solutions. We're very excited that Frederick and his team are going to be present in our tech expo. Um, and we're also going to be thinking about biotechnology and the solutions um, in, in food uh, and agricultural space, uh, water solutions, like how do we tackle the, the huge um, water crisis that different parts of the world and, and certainly in the United States is facing. So those are the type of conversations that we're going to have at Aspen IDS Climate and I'm uh, certainly very, very thankful to FIU. They're a wonderful partner. Um, uh, our uh, participants go on tours to different facilities, and FIU certainly invites us every year to, to come check out their amazing, amazing work and amazing facilities. So I'm excited, and I hope that any of you who are going to be in Miami are going to join us. Great, Maria. Thank you. And Frederick, with what OnePrint is doing, and you are, being, you are involved with uh, Aspen Ideas Climate, why is that important to you and the company? Um, for us, it's going to be a little bit of our coming out of the shell here. We had our company for around two years, but we have been very, very um, under the radar here. And we were first going to do resilient housing. So, so we were in the housing sector going to 3D print house. Maybe you have seen 3D printing of houses. But um, around one year and two months ago, 
we we were with our um, partner Titan Cement up in Tallahassee, and we we're doing some R and D on housing. And then we got a call from 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 another partner at Titan and say we just had a meeting with some some uh, partners at UM who has a grant from from DARPA called Reefens, and they're building artificial reefs. We said okay, let's try it. So. We brought over the the product, plugged it into our printer, and started printing. And then one thing led to another, and we pivoted into infrastructure, and especially sustainable and resilient infrastructure. And we um, so we work with green gray coastal protection system, basically the gray in the concrete and the green in the oysters, the mangroves, and the corals that can grow on those and create a strong strong hybrid barrier. So for us, it's perfect. We are part of the uh, South Florida Climate Resiliency Tech Hub, and we were able to get a boot from there with 10 other partners, FIU included. Um, so we're super excited, and we want to have this collaboration with different universities, different IP, so we can bring those products out to mass scale, because it's not R&D anymore. There is a big need for uh, and a big problem that needs to be addressed and it needs to scale. So our, our plan is now to come out and, and develop new IPs, but also commercialize IP, in this case, the Sea Hive technology from University of Miami, and bring it out to all over Florida and all over the U.S. and beyond, hopefully. So we are... Um, Super excited to 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 attend Aspen and uh, yeah, last year I was there as a visitor and now I'm and now we're exhibiting, so it's exciting. <laughs> we love that. Thank you, Frederick. We love we love when worlds collide and, and keep on going. So we've all kind of touched a little bit on uh, Miami being the first and only climate ready tech hub with that great video to to give an introduction. So Maria, how do you see how Aspen can continue to support Miami and how can Miami in 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 turn support Aspen Ideas and climate? That's a great question. I would say that um, Aspen Ideas climate is Miami. It's not separate from the two. We are very proud to uh, call the city of Miami Beach our partner. And we have really tried to build this event around what is relevant for Miami as it seeks for solutions to face the great challenges that climate change is already posing to Miami. Sea level rise, extreme weather events. Uh, yeah, it's a very wide range of, of, of impacts, let's say. So when we are shaping uh, the conference, we really seek to engage the community in Miami and listen to what is relevant. Uh, we know, for instance, that housing, resilient housing is a huge um, uh, issue in Miami. So what, those are part of the, that, that's part of the way how we develop the agenda for the conference, that like we really seek to create an event that is relevant for the folks who live in the city. So it's not necessarily one conference that just lands there just because there's a conference center, but really is, a, is, is an event that we do in partnership with uh, our local stakeholders. And, and in the end, Miami is, yes, it is a, a city that, Miami Beach is a city that is facing the effects of climate change, but it's also a huge hub for innovation and creativity. So we are really lucky to be able to tap into that innovation and can-do sphere that Miami has to develop this event. Great, Maria, thank you. And Frederick, I believe you've been involved with uh, the Tech Hub, oh, not from the beginning, but you know, for quite some time. Share a little bit about your insight there. Yeah, we were actually um, there from the actual first meeting. So, so um, that was also a coincidence that let led to us being there, and it has been my business partner who you saw there at, at the video in the beginning, Adam Friedman, who has, been, who has been driving that initiative. But it has been very interesting and learning experience for me and for Adam to be in a project of this size, where, where so many different entities collaborating, universities, um, government, um, and everyone is coming together for one common goal, and that's to make Miami, the center for, for resilient and sustainable infrastructure and renewable energy. Um, so it's exciting to be a part of it. And um, we, um, um, we believe it's going to be important for us, for sure, to be able to scale the workforce that we, is, that we are needing for, for, for our products and for our 
development. It's new type of workforce that is needed in this blue economy, in the climate tech economy that is probably not has been um, there before. So it's unique skill sets that is needed. And there I think, you know, all of these initiatives, Aspen, Emerge, Climate Tech Hub will really put Miami on the map to be, to be uh, climate ready. Great, thank you. And, and as we wrap up, I, we can't have a con convening of the 305 without asking, why Miami? Are we, are, is this our prime? Is this our renaissance? And how can, how can we work together on that, Maria? Uh, I would say, how could we not be working in Miami? <laughs> That's the only thing that I, I would say. It's, it, was, it has really been such a, such a pleasure to have uh, our conference there, uh, obviously beautiful weather, beautiful setting, but really such a warm welcome that we've received and, and, and folks have been very open to partner and to talk to us. So yeah, we're, we're nothing but thankful. Great, Frederick, why Miami? Oh, I think it's a fantastic place and it's very diverse. We can see in our staff, we have people from all over the world and everyone is coming together working um, together. It is vibrating Miami. A lot of things are happening on the tech side, on the climate side, but there is also real threats from increased weather events, rising sea levels, and those has to be, has to be tackled because people there are feeling it from raised insurance costs to, 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 uh, to other things. And um, it is a big problem, so we need to get ready for, for, for hurricanes and r the rising sea level. Great. Frederick, Maria, thank you so much. Nicole, do we have time for a couple questions? Does anyone have any questions for Maria or Frederick? Frederick, I, I just want to tell you that you're a brilliant man. Thank you. you first of all, you have an amazing mother. Yeah, okay? Thank you. <laughs> so I just want to mention that. Um, from the standpoint of um, an architect who's looking for a solution that really responds to the crisis that we're seeing coming up these days, and just as far as market forces are concerned, what does your sales pitch to them as far as uh, your capabilities right now? So as an architect, we not only work with um, coastal resiliency and, and, um, and infrastructure, we also work with commercial buildings and, and housing. And we are developing programs with partners um, where we can, where we need more architectural solutions, more engineers to rethink engineering um, and architecture, because what you can do with the 3D printers is different what you can do with conventional building. And there is a lot of upsides and, and we can build very strong houses and with time also very low cost housing. Um, and that's what it's needed. But it, we need that firepower from from architecture to work with engineers to come up with smart new solutions for housing. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, I'm gonna thank Maria and Frederick. Thank you so much. Carlos, I believe I turn it over to you. Thank you. Actually, Daniel Chavez, my colleague. Alrighty, everyone. So I have a little bit of a special video here for you guys. Um, first off, I want to give big props and thanks to the offices of uh, Mario diaz Bellart, uh, Carlos Jimenez, uh, Maria Salazar, and of course, Frederica Wilson. And a big honorable shout out to uh, Debbie Washman Schultz and her team as well. Um, we might not all agree on uh, policies and all sorts of things. You know, we all have different opinions, but we can agree on two things, which is FIU and cafecito. So here, I'm just gonna let the video take it away. Cuban cafecito is like a shot of... Oh, I can't that on camera. This is 10 points right here. Patria y vida. 
Delicious. Also, appropriation season is coming up. The county's going to have a few community project funding requests coming. A few requests coming up soon. Some community project requests coming. And so, I'm going to fill in today. I have confidence in uh, Carlos and Anna. We've got a chance. Best guys. Oh uh, it is probably my favorite part of it. Get her so some of the best cappuccino I had was down in Miami at a laundromat. It was a recommendation. <laughs> Y'all are going to want to take from the dispatch right here. Oh, one more, one more. Perfect amount of sweetness. Pretty good. Run back to South Florida. Yes. <laughs> Run back. That was made by Lou. By Lou. Oh, it's very human. It's from Mississippi. Where in Mississippi? <laughs> Us. <laughs> a little dog! Prepare your defense. Yeah, there you go. Another day on the hill. It's coming. Hey, hey, hey come on out. What is going on? This is the impartial Capacito Judging Commission. Yes. <laughs> All right, I love it. I'm feeling confident. Tides will tell you that you're not supposed to tamper when agitated is what makes the espumita itself. So failure to have enough of it will mean that you have the worst espumita you've ever seen. We're, we're hoping that this lives up to the laundry mat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you, you can't find decent Cuban food up here, or a cafecito, unless you go to FIU. So they're they are proud of their capacity too. No more than that. Like comes into <laughs> getting an oaky flavor. Right. With some hints of sugar. There's an earthy tone to it, for sure. I could tell you that the laundromat where I had the best capacito in Miami is in their district. So <laughs> for our congressional delegation, but tonight we're here to honor our delegation staffers who tirelessly deliver for the 305 every day. We want to recognize their relentless work in serving our South Florida community and meeting with constituents who travel from Miami. Our South Florida congressional staffers work hard at serving the members of our community with their grace and commitment to service, which we are certain is fueled by their countless cafecito shots they have in their office. 
This year, FIU hosted an inaugural Congressional Cafecito Challenge to see who really has the best cafecito in town. In fact, not only was this just a cafecito challenge, but it was also really to see who is the most So Miami office. To start off, we want to give a special shout out to Charlie Cadden from Team Wasserman Schultz. We understand that Charlie is a former barista <laughs> and is ready to start production at, our, at their office and we'd like to give you a gift as a special thank you and welcome you to joining the tradition. <laughs> we will now be transitioning to the long anticipated award portion of the night. So. Our first award is for the most authentic presentation. This recognition is for the group that really embodied the culture and spirit of Miami. And yes, we've been keeping up with your social media pages, so of course we had to give them extra points for posting a picture with the Assistant Secretary of Defense. Sorry, that was my job. <laughs> <laughs> with the Assistant Secretary of Defense, Heidi Shu, featuring our signature FIU Cafecito Cup. <laughs> I believe uh, representatives from Congressman Jimenez is here? Yes. There you go, Nicholas Otalola. Wait, the certificates are here. There you go. As he drinks his Sun Blazer beer, by the way. <laughs> All right, there you go, sir. Thank you for coming. Next, we would like to announce the second award for Azúcar, the sweetest in spirit of Celia. So this award is presented not only to the sweetest cup of cafecito, but also one that pays special tribute to Miami Cuban singer and legendary queen of salsa music, Celia Cruz. We want to recognize that this team also had the best cross-trained staffed barista. Is Luke here? Mr. Mississippi, or anyone from Congresswoman Salazar? I know they're all their way. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, the winner is Team Salazar. <laughs> Next up for our word, awards, we have Best Espumita. And if you know anything about the true art and craftsmanship of an excellent cafecito, you know it all comes down to the iconic sugary espumita on top. Without it, it wouldn't be a true cup of cafecito. This team not only had the best espumita, but also all the vibes of Miami running through their office. So the next winner is Team Diaz Ballart. Andrea? Darn congressional schedules, but she's on the <laughs> <laughs> Now for our final award, we have this year's 2024 overall award winner. And based on our video, I'm pretty sure you all can take a good guess as to who that winner is. This group thoughtfully curated the Miami vibe with an outstanding presentation, iconic music choice, delicious pastries, and of course, their cafecito. And the winner well, of... First off, I have to say, uh, once our 3D printer uh, completes uh, production, we have a little, uh, all of our offices and winners will get a lovely little mocha gold cup. But the overall winner tonight is who? Team Wilson. And Congresswoman, although... Although one of the uh, one of the metrics and categories, you know, of course, taste and espumita production, but of course, I mean, we have to give extra points for the member. And look at this. Look at that. Look at that It was better than the coffee at the laundromat. <laughs> I want you to know that the laundromat coffee. <laughs> that was perfect scores all at once. <laughs>
You want to get one with the Same right here? Right there? One with the box. Three? How's your here if you want to that's true that's beautiful thank you all right and we will make sure Team Diaz Ballard, Jimenez, Salazar, I know everyone's on their way, gets their uh, beautiful statuettes. But uh, I think as we're wrapping up, uh, we want to thank you all for coming and uh, taking a little bit of time out of uh, what is even a more Super Tuesday, uh, with uh, it being 305 Day, uh, to celebrate and come together. So many friends and partners and alumni and Miamians that are here in the district. As we wrap up, uh, we're going to let you roll out with a teaser video, a sizzle video of... Uh, next week's Aspen Climate Ideas uh, uh, Festival. So thank you. Thank you all. I love that this is an important conference <clears throat> focusing on solution. We have big, big challenges, and with that will come big solutions, and we are already very aggressively pursuing them. And the best way to get hard problems addressed is to want to bring them to the forefront, set goals, and get the brightest minds thinking about them, working on them, making progress. It's such a pleasure to see thinkers and leaders and doers from every sector gather together for understanding and for solutions. The exponential opportunity we have to create incredible quality food, quality blue jobs, move into a new blue economy, hope really is in the water. Access to clean drinking water should be a right, not a privilege of those who can afford it. The ability to make sure that everyone has a seat at the table, to ensure that they understand how to make changes inside of their community. Here in Miami, we don't have the luxury of putting our head in the sand and pretending that these problems don't exist. We need to address climate doom and the way that we communicate and the way that we publish academic papers and the way that we go about policy. This is an everyday challenge, every day, every week, every month, and every year. You know, this country was built to make big decisions and to push hard and to try and win. We cannot do that as a house divided. We're feeding into it by allowing this to become the most partisan issue of our time and it should be the most unifying issue. I'm a Republican and I'm here to talk climate. <laughs> The biggest insight we could all embrace is we are in charge now. Humans are in charge of the whole planet. We are stewards of the earth. If there's one thing climbers are all about, it's imagining improbable solutions and making them a reality. This is a moment of possibility, and it requires us to have a lot of courage. So when it comes to solving climate in our communities, we need to operate at the speed of trust. We should have a lot more urgency as a country. Why are we building any school or any public building for that matter that isn't net zero? I owe it to myself to test my views and what's the worst that could happen? I could change my mind. I think this is an opportunity for local government to illustrate what could happen when it's done right. Climate change is a borderless challenge. We all need to be working together to drive it positive impact on this world. We know what to do, and we know how to get there. We need to roll up our sleeves and simply get to work. We'll see everyone next week, but yeah. quick point of personal privilege. I know I quickly introduced her at the start of the program. If I can uh, lean on my good friend, B Brickle. Uh, B is here, and we'll be here for another few minutes uh, to chat, but B, you're working on an exciting uh, project that also Turn it back. Uh, leverages and hinges on Miami's history and I am and uh, you guys have all these fantastic things you do here's mine ah. <laughs> yeah, <turn it> back. <laughs> okay you all know Miami's the magic city but there were people way back when who did fabulous things and one of them was Medford Ross Kellum, who in 1924 took an old schooner, 
had it renamed Kamaloa, which means wanderer in Tahitian, and took it from the west coast of uh, California all the way through the Line Islands. No one ever heard of the Line Islands, I bet, to Tahiti. And he took with him six scientists from Bishop's Museum in Hawaii so that the trip also was a recording of what life was like then because it quickly changed with the coming of the Second World War and they were able to document some of the early dances and I guess the lives of the Gilbertees and the Caroline Island people and uh, they made quite a, quite a record of it and uh, Cesar, Carlos' brother, Another Becerro traveled to Hawaii. He looked at some of the original pictures, photographs, di the diaries. He went on to uh, Tahiti, looked at di diff different things there. And we, he has a new book coming out, which will be published early in 2025, which tells really the story of the six-month voyage, what they did, what they saw, how they handled specimens, the people that they met, and it really uh, records a life and time that doesn't exist anymore. But I think the important thing to understand is, here's a guy who was born in 1877. Uh, his mother died when he was seven years old, his father when he was 10 years old, and he finds himself practically an orphan, standing, I think, on the wharf of down in Key West, and seeing those beautiful sailing schooners coming in from all over the world, and I think right then and there, he made up his mind, I'm going to have a ship like that one day, and I'm going to sail it across the Pacific. Now, the Pacific, how big is it? It would hold all the continents of the world and still have space left over. So, and you have to remember in 1924, nobody really knew much about that area of the world. And uh, when I first talked to Carlos about that, this just quick talk, he said, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about technology. What was technology like back then? Well, technology is really taking ideas that people have and making them into something practical and useful. And on the ship, besides having the scientist, he had two Atlas diesel engines. He had a refrigeration system that also produced 200 pounds of ice every day. He had get this flush toilets. He had electricity, and he had a new kind of a uh, shortwave system that would allow him to radio as far back as to California. And this was a huge breakthrough because before that, when ships were out in the Pacific Ocean, they had no contact with land. They didn't know when storms were coming. They didn't know what was going on. So this made a huge difference, uh, I think, in the la life of just the cargoes that went back and forth. So, uh, so Med Kellum uh, had an adventurous life, but he had a plan. And he was really from Miami. He made Miami his home. People always talked about him as the Miami capitalist, the Miami adventurer. But he was one of the people that I think early embodied the spirit of Miami. And it, you all have built on it. But I think back then there were people that did a very important job, and he was one of them. So the name of the book is going to be Kamaloa Project. And I'm sure that Carlos will keep you informed. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Really, as the last item of it, I didn't do my job. Uh, B, we have an amazing collection of the family's papers and books at the Green Library on campus. So that's another important connection to a very important family to Miami's history. So we want to thank B. We want to thank everyone. Please stick around. We've got refreshments and snacks. Uh, and happy 305 Day.